Good morning. Buenos dias. Bonjour, bon dia, ni calma. Good morning. Welcome to a, a discussion on the face of American diplomacy. Very pleased that all of you have joined us. We have a stellar group of people who will be speaking about this this morning. Uh, my job is to merely introduce what we're going to be talking about and then turn it over to the people that actually know today's uh, uh, today's substance. Um, I'm Andrew Seeley. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson C Center here on behalf of Jane Harmon, who is out today, and uh, very pleased to be able to partner with the U United States Diplomacy Center. For those of you that don't yet know the United States Diplomacy Center, you may remember that great photograph in the newspaper a while back of, of six current and former secretaries of state, each with shovels, digging into the ground. And I believe it was a muddy day, if I remember correctly. At least that's the image in my mind. Breaking ground for, for what is going to be an extraordinary museum of public uh, of foreign service in the United States and of public diplomacy um, near the State Department building. It will be a um, both a museum. They have already 6,000 exhibits that they've lined up when it, for when it opens. It's going to be an educational space as well that brings in student groups and other groups that want to learn about public diplomacy. And we, there's a taste of this and, and what we're here to celebrate today and commemorate and, and do a little bit of substantive discussion on is a, is a taste of this that they've put down in the Reagan building. Um, the face of public diplomacy, which follows the careers of 10 uh, people involved in public diplomacy in, in some way in U.S. foreign policy, foreign service officers and others, people involved in the State Department and USAID, and it tells their stories in their own words and it has pictures of them and strongly recommend, if you haven't seen it yet, when you leave here, you go down and take a look at it. It, it is near the atrium of, of the Reagan building, if you walk down a floor in this building. Um, we are very pleased to partner with the U.S. Diplomacy Center. We think this is a fabulous initiative. Um, we are, are immensely honored to have um, Ambassador Arnold Chacon with us, who will be who is the, now the new Director General of the Foreign Service and Head of Human Resources for the State Department. We're extremely pleased that Diana Negroponte, Dr. Diana Negroponte, is going to moderate the panel today. She is one of our public policy fellows. She's also a member of our Mexico Institute board as well, and a good friend of the Wilson Center for many, many years, and uh, someone who knows a great deal about public diplomacy herself from, from, I'm sure she will talk about this a bit, but from her life's work, um, both as a scholar um, and as someone who's been deeply involved in American American foreign policy in multiple ways. Um, it is my uh, great pleasure also to introduce to you Shante Moore, who will uh, kick off today's discussion on behalf of the State Department. Shante joined the Foreign Service in 2000. He currently serves as Deputy Counselor for the Development Economic Section in the U.S. Mission at the Organization of American States. They're interesting times at the OAS for those of us that follow these things. Um, they're about to change leadership. He is an econ uh, economic coned officer and he served in five consecutive overseas tours. That is a lot of commitment and a lot of service. Um, to do five overseas tours. Kuwait, Qatar, Kosovo, Nicaragua, and Afghanistan. He chooses all, all the, the beautiful vacation spots, as you can tell. Fabulous countries, countries where, that, where there really are meaningful engagement on the ground and where there's a great deal of, of work to be done in partnership with, with those countries and, and people in those countries. He specializes in trade, export promotion, private sector development, and commercial advocacy. He is fluent in Spanish. Ya lo probé. We spoke a little bit earlier this morning, and uh, is professionally proficient in Arabic and Dari as well. He received his undergraduate degree from Kansas State University and his graduate degree from Georgetown University's Master of Science in Foreign Service program. He is a Truman Scholar, a Fulbright Scholar in Paraguay in '97 to '98, and a Pickering Fellow. He was born in Benton Harbor, Michigan, and he spent his formative years in Kansas. He's married to Sylvia Diaz Moore, and they have a four year old son named Kendrick. They live in Elk Ridge, Maryland, and it's my great pleasure to turn this over to Shante. And welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Great to be with all of you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, I'm glad to be here today, and I have the great pleasure to, to introduce Ambassador, Ambassador Arnold H. Chacon, Director General of the Foreign Service and Human Resources, for this important discussion. But before I do, let me say that today's topic on the changing faces and changing roles of the Foreign Service is very relevant to me. I represent and am a benefactor of the efforts of the Department of State, USAID, and other foreign affairs agencies to ensure that the Foreign Service looks like the United States. As mentioned, in 1998, I was a member of the first cohort of what was known then as the Graduate and Foreign Affairs Fellowship, now known as the Pickering Fellowship. Um, to try to include, you know, you know, minorities, women, you know, and other, you know, groups, you know, into the Foreign Service. 
And as mentioned, as someone who grew up in, you know, in small towns like Ben Harbor and in Kansas, I knew much more about like wheat and corn than, than foreign, <laughs> foreign, foreign affairs. However, you know, my interest in public service and international affairs, you know, it fortunately helped me to learn about and apply for the Pickering Fellowship and eventually establish, you know, my career in the Foreign Service. As mentioned, you know, I've served in Kuwait, you know, Qatar, Kosovo, Nicaragua, and Afghanistan. I'm currently serving in a U.S. mission to the Organization of American States, which is by far the least stressful assignment that I've had with regard to security. I also have the honor of participating in the Faces of Diplomacy exhibit now shown in, in the atrium gallery in this building, in the Ronald Reagan building. The Faces of Diplomacy, Diplomacy project, you know, was created by the U.S. Diplomacy Center for the American People that highlights the careers of six State Department and USAID Foreign Service officers who show the broad range of U.S. foreign policy practitioners. We make significant contributions to our country's security and economic prosperity and lead the efforts to achieve peace and improve the lives of people throughout the world. I urge everyone to please take a look at the Faces of Diplomacy exhibit to learn about the great foreign policy work and experiences of some of our finest Foreign Service officers. Now, speaking of our finest and finest Foreign Service officers and an important distinguished face of U.S. diplomacy, allow me to introduce our featured speaker for today's discussion, Ambassador Arnold A. Chacon. Just two months ago, on December 22nd, Ambassador Chacon was sworn in as the Director General of the Foreign Service and Director of Human Resources. A career member of the Foreign Service for 33 years, he was U.S. Ambassador to Guatemala from August 2011 until March 2014. From 2008 until 2011, he served as Deputy Chief of Mission in Madrid, Spain, and before that as the De Deputy Executive Secretary and the Secretary of State's Executive Secretariat. Ambassador Chacon has also served at many of our posts around the world, including Honduras, Mexico, Chile, Italy, Peru, and Ecuador, as well as Washington, D.C., and, and the U.S. Mission to the United Nations in New York. Director General Chacon is a graduate of the University of Colorado at Boulder. His wife, Alita Chacon, is also a member of the Foreign Service. So without further ado, please welcome Ambassador Chacon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shante, for that uh, very kind introduction. I I'm so proud to have someone like Shante uh, uh, introduce me. Uh, he's really, truly one of our success stories, someone that we seek to showcase about uh, the evolving Foreign Service and just, you know, what incre incredible talent we have uh, with working with us today. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you this morning. As Shante mentioned, I've been uh, at the helm as Director General for two months now. And uh, I know that the State Department and the Wilson Center have a long and fruitful relationship that I really hope to expand on and, and encourage as Director General. Um, many, of course, of our most talented employees are affiliated with the Wilson Center, and it's an outstanding institution, and again, a, a real privilege to be here. Um, we're proud always to partner with the Wilson Center and, of course, with our Diplomacy Center. Uh, one of our principal aims and one of my, my priorities, of course, is to share the story of how diplomacy has a visible, tangible, positive impact in advancing America's values, interests, and goals around the world, and how it serves the American people. And uh, my, my greatest priority is to do a much better job of reaching out to America and to everyone to explain and demystify what it is that we do and why we love so much uh, our beloved institution of the State Department. I'd like to begin by laying out some broad themes and then leave some time for discussion, of course, uh, with our distinguished panelists that we have here today. First of all, I think all of us in this room can um, agree that the world is characterized by forces of disruptive change. The uh, international environment is often messy, fast-paced, and with pockets of un instability and unpredictability. And although the dangers of the Cold War nuclear confrontation are not as great as they once were when I first joined the Foreign Service, there certainly are plenty of dangers, perils, and challenges out there. They're more diverse, they're more complex, more widespread, more vir virulent, and more dynamic than even just a generation ago. Some are urgent and acute, uh, requiring an immediate response and action. Others are chronic and protracted, but still require relentless attention, care, and effort. Still others must be contained and managed, and others require concerted, 
collaborative intervention over a sustained period of time. Uh, just a partial listing is dizzying. We have interstate conflicts, border incursions, and so-called frozen conflicts that threaten established norms of international behavior and long-standing negotiated agreements. We have intrastate conflicts, including civil wars, refugee, and internally displaced persons. We have failed and failing states that impact a wider region. We have non-state actors to contend with. Many are lethal and a threat to regional stability, such as ISIL or ISIS, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, and the Al-Shabaab terrorist group in Somalia. We have transnational threats, most notably terrorism and violent extremism, but also um, narcotics trafficking and organized crime. Uh, let's not forget cyber threats and cybersecurity, now a much more acute risk and threat with each new hack. We have nuclear, biological, chemical, and missile proliferation and efforts to contain or eliminate these threats. We have uh, challenges such as economic, financial, and extractive industry and energy disruptions. We have rule of law, civilian justice, human rights in all of its manifestations, and internal governance writ large. Environmental and climatological change with pressure on water and other natural resources and health issues including pandemics and virulent pathogens, and I could go on and on. Many of these, of course, are interrelated, uh, and given the speed of transportation and information, the relentless news cycle that we all know, uh, and the social media revolution, of course, we often face very short response times, whether to address the substance of the issue or get out our message about what we're doing. In many instances, analyzing the problem is relatively easy. Devising prescriptions is harder, and applying a remedy is harder still. And that brings me to my larger point. America has been and will continue to be essential and, yes, indispensable in marshalling the world to take on these challenges. If we uh, conceive of American strategy formulation and execution on a broad scale, and that is defense, development, and diplomacy, that is where the State Department truly is on the front lines. We are in the business of information, identifying, analyzing, disseminating, and making recommendations to prevent, preempt, or solve problems. We're in the networking business, identifying and cultivating programmatically the influential people in all fields. And of course, we're in the advocacy business, discussing, negotiating, persuading, and convincing others to act with and for us in making the world safer and more stable. Democracy, freedom, justice, transparency, shared prosperity, and environmental and energy sustainability are universal principles. Uh, I, I like to think of the State Department 10 years from now in 2025 when, when uh, we, l we look at, you know, where do we want to be and how do we cultivate our talent. Um, what are we asking of our talented employees of the State Department today? Certainly the, s the uh, President and the Secretary have challenged us to be more flexible, more agile, to adapt and learn at a much more accelerated pace. We're putting increased emphasis on precisely that, accentuating American values and leadership and management principles. The department's six core values, accountability, character, community, diversity, loyalty, and service are the foundation stone. Leadership and management are grounded in doing the right thing and doing things right. So to help prepare our workforce for present and future challenges, we are embarking on initiatives to enhance our effectiveness, to provide tools and resources that equip our people to better succeed, and to communicate internally and externally. So starting from a strong foundation, we want to reduce internal organizational complexity and increase our capacity for external delivery. In short, we need to focus on goals, on results, and impact, not on tasks, activities, and output. We're committed to leveraging training opportunities. The, strate the strategic use of training, of course, will serve us better. We're emphasizing employees' professional development, building the strongest cadres for the workforce we need today and for 2025 and beyond. Interesting fact that the Department of Civil Service has grown 45% since 2002. 
The Foreign Service has grown 48% since 2002 and 23% since 2008. That growth, unfortunately, is now over and we're hiring just to attrition owing to the budgets uh, we now have to uh, face uh, over the coming years. That means that we, we have to and must focus on internal transformation, eliminating inefficiencies, emphasizing outcome effectiveness, and helping employees build their com competencies and skill sets. The challenges are greater and so too are our capabilities. Our primary aim is a workforce geared to success in 2025 and beyond, a very future-looking transformation. Over the past 15 years, the Department has undergone a significant transformation. The days of an Ivy League-heavy foreign service are long gone. Now we need great emphasis uh, and great employees, irrespectful, uh, irrespective excuse me, of background, who are prepared to serve in tough places doing tough things. One-third of the Foreign Service now has less than five years of experience. Over two-thirds have served or now serving in hardship posts. And since 9-11-2001, we added an additional 500 Arabic speakers. We've added more than 40 Pashto speakers. We opened 20 posts in Muslim countries. We created the bureaus for energy, conflict stabilization, and counterterrorism and we're focusing greater attention on religious freedom, on anti-Semitism, on trafficking in persons, on global health, and on global women's issues. We're not certainly the same Foreign Service of 1980, and we're not even the Foreign Service of 2001. Our goal is to recruit, to retain, and sustain a workforce for 2025 and beyond, and it'll be one where human capital development will have an ever more prominent place. Our service employees will be characterized by their diverse background, broad substantive experience, and vast intellectual interests. We must constantly nurture bilateral and multilateral relations so that we can leverage and expand our reach and impact. That process of steady engagement of patient and diligent work away from the headlines means we need the very best people we can get into the Department of State. We want people who look over the horizon, who are curious, innovative, tenacious, who show initiative, judgment, resilience, adaptability, and perseverance. We've always had those people, actually, but it's even more important now and in the future. These attributes are not easily taught, of course, but often best learned and honed through real-life experience. Let me close by accentuating three points. One, accountability and service bracket our core values. Two, when we combine purpose and principle, we can do great things. And three, when we work hard to get the resources and tools to hit the targets we and the administration and Congress set out for our overarching strategic goals, we all succeed. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me. I look forward to sharing impressions with our distinguished panel of experts and, and of course, are happy to take questions from you later. Thank you very much. Ambassador Chacon, thank you very much for your remarks. I think if anyone was doubting whether they wanted to sign up, <laughs> the doubts are dispelled. We're all re-signing. <laughs> um, although in my case, um, I sign up as a pro bono. <laughs> <laughs> so many years <coughs> I say dependent. <clears throat> I've become independent, Sarah <laughs> Woodrow Wilson. You have raised very important issues, and we have two people who will agree in part but may challenge you in part. And I want to start with Robert Silverman, the president of the American Foreign Service Association, a professional organization rep representing foreign service officers. Robert himself has served, like so many of those here in this audience, in multiple posts, Riyadh and Baku being tough, Stockholm. Not so tough. <laughs> That's what you well deserved. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, my question for you, my first question is <coughs> the Director General focused on the career USAID Foreign Service officers. 
but we are seeing an increased number of political appointees posted to the heads of departments, to the leadership in the various functional areas. What's the future of the Foreign Service if a political appointee can leapfrog to take leadership posts? Well, great question, Diana. First, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to uh, Ambassador Chacon, uh, who is our new Director General of the Foreign Service. We're so pleased uh, on behalf of all of the members of AFSA. You know, we represent 30,000 people who are both active duty and retired in the Foreign Service, and we're so pleased to have our first uh, Director General in a few years. And so it's, it's uh, his coming and his arrival is, is a big celebration for us. Thank you. And I thank him for his remarks, and uh, I'm, I'm inspired. I'm going to start all over again. I'm going to volunteer to be a GSO <laughs> in Bujumbura. <laughs> I'm happy to start over again, but um, <laughs> it's probably too late for that. Um, let me first address your question, but also address the diversity agenda that we share with the State Department. But um, hold on, I've got diversity yes. for other okay. people, so please right. stay on Fair point. <laughs> okay, because I have a lot to say on that as well. Oh, we'll get to that. Okay. Well, look, uh, you're raising a very good point, which is um, the Foreign Service is changing. It's stronger than ever. Uh, its mission is laid out by Ambassador Chacon is, is a great one. It's attracting the same talented people that it always has, and it's now a more diverse uh, group than it has ever has been, which makes us stronger. Um, and it's always faced challenges. Uh, one of the challenges we have in the U.S., uh, unique among any um, developed country and probably unique among any uh, country is that we have a very high percentage of political appointees in our in our career uh, in our foreign ministry we have we're the outliers uh, in that respect and and so yes it's a challenge it's always been there um, it was there 20 years ago it was there 50 years ago and it's with us today and but there are increased number of political appointees today relative yes. to the uh, career I think that's right I mean AFSA in fact tracks those numbers I encourage people uh, to look at our website and, and see uh, those numbers. So I'm happy to discuss that as well as the, uh, the diversity agenda. But um, yes, it's a problem. Uh, I think uh, what I would say in short about that issue is that um, you know, the career folks, both civil service and foreign service, do welcome, should welcome, talented outsiders coming into our system. It adds uh, strength uh, to, um, to us to have people from outside perspectives who come from different walks of life who uh, you know, run embassies, who run bureaus of AID or state, that's a positive, uh, as long as uh, there's career development for the people coming into the system. Um, that is uh, the core issue for us, which is that people coming in, this strong, diverse group of people that we're so proud of, need to have careers all, all the way up to the top so that we continue to uh, attract and retain, retain the top talent. So, yes. Thank you, Robert. Ambassador Chacon. You provide training at the Foreign Service Institute, not only for the A1 class, the entering, but also for mid-level officers. What advice do you give them when they know that there is a political ceiling? Well, I, I think that uh, what we seek to do with mid-level people is to uh, give them the management and leadership training that they need because they will uh, soon be in situations where they will have to inspire, motivate, and lead others. And I think that, uh, that, 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 that is a critical skill set that we can't underemphasize. I, I don't really emphasize that there is a ceiling. I, don't, I think the wonderful thing about the Foreign Service is that you have these amazing opportunities. But you have to be ready to seize the day, to seize those uh, opportunities. And you have to be ready uh, you know, and well trained for them. Um, you know, one of our greatest strengths is working on teams. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, we're good at team building. We're, we're good at, at uh, really incorporating and taking the very best. Uh, and also dealing the hand we're dealt. So I, I don't see it as a limitation or a problem or a ceiling, but, but certainly as an opportunity. Uh, and they're certainly rising to the challenge. Uh, we also extend training uh, to non-career people as well. I, I, I was heartened to hear that we had non-career ambassadors that wanted specialized training when they prepared performance and evaluation reports on their mm -hmm. subject, because they want to do them well. Um, we all have very great 
uh, and so good stories to tell about working with non-career people as well. Uh, again, they add, they add diversity, they add a lot of value added that, that perhaps isn't evident to someone on the outside. But uh, again, it's, it's something that I know AFSA you know, uh, monitors very closely. I'm a, a member of AFSA for over 30 years. I understand that. I appreciate. But I do think that we can find common ground and work together uh, and executing the President and the Secretary of State's uh, priorities. Well, I admire your diplomatic language, <laughs> but I'm going to be, I'm going to pursue Please. this issue. Susan, I'm coming to you. In That's a okay. I'm happy to <laughs> listen Robert. to the dialogue. <laughs> and I have a thought on this too. Good. Excellent. Robert, Secretary of State, the two deputies, the Under Secretary for Political Affairs, Under Secretary for Political Affairs, which is traditionally a foreign service position are now all politicos. So the Ambassador Chacon talks about teamship, but the evidence is that politicos run the show. What are your members saying? What is the mood within Foreign mm. Service officers as far as their ability to be another Bill Burns? Right. He was recently the Deputy Secretary of State, and before that, ambassador to Russia and is a clear indication of how a Foreign Service officer can reach the top. Right. Who well, do people look to now? Well, let's see. Uh, we've run out of Burns. Uh, there was Nick Burns. <laughs> he was also great. He was undersecretary. There's Jillian Burns, by the way. She was great. She just retired. So we, I think we're, for the sh we're short on Burnses for the time being. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, what I would say is, uh, look, uh, we, this is an ongoing struggle. Uh, we need to maintain the ability for our top career people to go straight to the top of the system. It's in our national interest to do that. Um, that is not to say, just like Ambassador Chacon said, uh, you know, we're not uh, against political pointies in the system. They are going to be there, and they're going to be at the very top of our system. I mean, the Secretary should always have the ability to pick his or her own team, and, and so we're respectful of that right. And, uh, and, the, and the president has the right to appoint uh, the people that uh, that person wants uh, there. And, and we work uh, the same and this as hard as ever for whoever is at the top. And, it, and the collective experience of the Foreign Service, I would say, is that um, there are very good political appointees, very good non-career people who come in who, who bring added uh, perspectives and new, new initiatives, and, and we welcome that as long as a two things uh, those people are qualified for, you know they have top qualifications that are uh, understood um, that um, and that that there is career development up to the top of the system uh, for this very strong uh, career ranks both civil service and foreign service that we're so proud of so yes so can, can I move sure, to the absolutely. member of the panel who has been discreet and silent but needs to talk <laughs> Susan Reichel, a career Foreign Service officer, is now the counselor to USAID. She likewise has served in tough assignments, Haiti, Nicaragua, Russia, Colombia, but you now take a leadership role at a USAID. Your views on this issue? Yeah, it, no, th so thank you very much, and thanks to the Wilson Center for hosting this today, and it's just great to be able to highlight our faces of diplomacy in the Diplomacy Center, and to Diana for, for uh, moderating to welcome our new Director General. It's just wonderful to have him. I, yeah, Bob and I have talked about this issue uh, for the last more than a year, and, and I've dug into this and looked at the numbers within USAID, uh, and actually they haven't changed. Our, um, as far as the non career or political appointees within the agency have actually remained very steady in, uh, over the last 25 years or so. And when Administrator Shaw, who was our administrator for five years, stepped down just last week, as a matter of fact, um, he was very conscious about really looking for career, not only Foreign Service, but our senior executive service, who could be leading the bureaus and, and to elevate them into those positions. And I learned actually from our administrator, uh, McPherson, 
Harrison during the Reagan administration, he uh, he called me a couple months ago. We were on a panel together. And he said, "Do you know why uh, the history of your position, the counselor at USAID?" And I said, "No, sir, I don't." And he said, "Well, it's traditionally in other departments and agencies. It's uh, actually a political position." But Administrator McPherson uh, was called one day by the Reagan White House and said, "You need to make the deputy administrator a political position as opposed to a foreign service." And he said, "I knew I needed a career person in the front office to advise me." So 25 years later, 30 years later, uh, this position now continues as a senior foreign service position. Can I? Sorry, Pastor. Sherman. I'm just, you know, eager to to uh, point out a very interesting statistic. Um, in my view, some of the more influential people at the Department of State, regardless of where they may fall in, in the rank and file, are our assistant secretaries of the regional mm -hmm. bureaus. Mm -hmm. uh, we have six regional bureaus, if I'm counting correctly. Five of them are, are uh, led by women, one by a man, mm -hmm. and five of the six are career officials. Uh, you know, Ann Patterson to Roberta Jacobson, you know, to uh, Danny Russell, uh, to Linda Thomas Greenfield. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a major accomplishment, mm -hmm. and so one could actually say that is very new and novel uh, in the sense mm -hmm. that it hasn't happened before. We have, of course, uh, Tom Shannon, our counselor of the department, mm -hmm. again, in a very influential position on the seventh floor. So the people that really get the work done and know and advise and have access, you know, to the seventh floor are, in fact, career officials. You raised my second subject that I want to address, which is the issue of diversity. Mm. When Ambassador Chacon joined the Foreign Service and his first posting in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and Ambassador Ford, thank you for joining us here today, a man who knows that embassy well. <laughs> there were very few Latinos and even few heroes, Shane. What's changed? What's changed is I think we're doing uh, better at strategic recruitment. Um, I, I'm uh, fond of saying we have an elite service, but we don't have to be elitist. So uh, I would say in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, we've made a concerted effort through 16 diplomats and residents that we have posted throughout the United States to take our story out uh, and demystify what the Foreign Service and the State Department is all about. Um, I kind of stumbled in the Foreign Service because I was doing volunteer work in Latin America and I ran into an AID official and I was so taken by the work they were doing. Knew nothing about the Foreign Service, but I had done this actually in high school so I was able to go back to university and prepare myself to enter into the Foreign Service and then of course had uh, more and more contact with people, but, but it didn't happen as often as it does today. I think uh, for people that are coming to the Foreign Service, some 60% have had contact with a diplomat in residence. It makes all of the difference. So in that regard, I think um, you know, we're, we're doing much better. Um, we, we do have uh, underserved communities, and I like to talk about diversity in the broadest sense of the word, that um, have lots of options, frankly. Um, you know, my job is to get to them before they go to Wall Street and before they go to become a lawyer, et cetera, because I'm finding many people love the Foreign Service as a second career. They're coming in at 32, 33, because this idea of public service motivates them and they understand that, that they really will be making a difference, you know, uh, in, in this regard. Susan, can we raise the issue of gender? Absolutely. So when your elder sisters joined the Foreign Service, uh, <laughs> what did they have to do? Yeah, uh, so it's fascinating to look back on the history of the Foreign Service and um, women in the Foreign Service. And if you look back to 1971, for example, 1% of the Foreign Service was made up of women. And if you were a Foreign Service officer, you were that lucky 1%, and you got married, you had to resign from the Foreign Service. So we have come a very long way. When I was looking at the Foreign Service uh, in college in about 1986, 87, it was 7% of the Foreign Service was made up of women. And I remember walking out of that counseling session, looking at that data saying, 
I'll never make it. I should just really look at some other things and went overseas for a year and went to grad school. But similar to what Ambassador Chacon said, uh, having an opportunity at, through an internship, and I think we'll talk about the, we talked about the Pickerings Fellows, which is great, and we have the Wrangles Fellow mm. and the uh, Payne Fellowship now to recruit people in through internships. And I really recommend that, whether it's at the State Department or USAID. And I had the opportunity through an internship and I frankly fell in love. And I said, this is what I want to do and I'm going to work as hard as it takes in order to join USAID's Foreign Service. And I was very fortunate that at that point in the 90s, uh, there was a real recruitment of women. And uh, about 25% of the Foreign Service was uh, coming in were, were women. And now we're at almost 50%. So we have come a long way. Uh, we have the Women at Aid uh, Affinity Group, just as the State Department as well has a, has a group. What we're finding, though, is that we are losing, um, not just in the Foreign Service, uh, but even at the Senior Executive Service, we're losing people at that level, the Senior Foreign Service and the Senior executive service. And I think it gets a, a bit to what Ambassador Chacon was also emphasizing in his remarks of, you know, the Foreign Service has changed. Our work has changed. Um, it is expeditionary. We are in unaccompanied posts. Uh, Eighty percent of our Foreign Service, uh, because USAID only works really in developing or high threat environments, 80 percent of us have to serve unaccompanied, which means separated from our families, uh, and 50 percent in countries such as Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Sudan, and Yemen. So uh, this is something that you, it's a family commitment, and I think as a result, it is at times tougher on women than to say, I'll do it for a while, and loves the career, and is passionate about the mission, mm -hmm. but then at a point with uh, family responsibilities and dual careers, so we're focusing on how do we help all women, um, all within the, the Foreign Service and whatever, wherever you come from, uh, to be able to really uh, succeed and reach your ambition. Susan, thank you. You raise an issue which we need to discuss in a group, and that is the Benghazi phenomenon. No Foreign Service officer or USAID officer will come home in a body bag. So don't leave the mission. <laughs> Stay at your computer, read the newspapers. <laughs> but that's not why men and women join USAID and the Foreign Service. So Ambassador Chacon, what advice do you give to an enthusiastic um, idealist who wants to serve? You can never reduce risk to absolute zero, and I think the focus has been misplaced on, on, on that, and I think uh, uh, as a consequence, people do get the impression that somehow we, we're not doing the work that we're intended to do because we're all uh, holding our offices and the like. It's all about working smartly, and again, we have a, an innovative, creative group of people that really can work around the danger issues. Um, of course, post Benghazi, we had an accountability review board, and again, we got additional resources, and it was very useful to get the support of the Congress and the American people uh, to, again, work smartly and to be able to do our jobs more efficiently. Um, you know, we, 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 we I think, are, are, are much better at anticipating problems, at drawing down when we need to, but then building right back up. We don't necessarily bring people back to the United States, but we can uh, put them in another nearby country where they can continue to do their work. So, so again, yes, my, as a chief of mission, my overriding priority was to keep my people safe. That There was nothing more important that I did. But that is not to say that, uh, you know, it, it is the focus on reducing risk to zero because, you know, there's risk in everything we do, you know, no matter where we are. Again, it, it's about working smartly, and I think we're, we're, we're doing that today much better than we did perhaps in the past. Robert Silverman, mm -hmm. young men and women join the Foreign Service to be able to go out and meet leaders of the opposition, trade union leaders, teachers are dis uh, in dissent with the government. Do they still have the same ability to interact with those important sectors of society who aren't necessarily in favor with the U.S. government? Or must they correspond electronically? Right. Well, thank you for asking. Um, this is <coughs> an area of security and, and the balance between risk and ability to get out, which um, 
my organization, AFSA, feels very strongly about. It's one of our three top issues in our strategic plan. And we're engaged directly with Ambassador Chacon, with uh, Susan at AID, and all the other folks within the administration and also in Congress about it because we are concerned. And uh, just as uh, Ambassador Chacon articulated, there is always going to be a balance between uh, ability to get out. Every place has its risks, and, and yet that is the core mission of, of the uh, Foreign Service is to get out, uh, influence people, report back what they're saying, and be engaged, and that's why people sign up. And uh, because of Benghazi, uh, that risk balance equation has been changed and we're concerned about it. And um, what I would say, the shorthand, without going into a lot of detail, is we need to empower, we need to ensure that it's the uh, emergency action committee at post and the ambassador at post, the people on the ground who have, uh, continue to have the final say in, in, in what the, how to play out that risk reward because it's the people on the ground, just like in the military, it's the commander in the field that needs to make those tactical decisions and uh, the concern about the fallout from the Benghazi incident, which was unfortunate, tragic, but you know there are a lot of deaths in the Foreign Service. Uh, we've done the numbers. Uh, here's an interesting statistic, is that <coughs> Foreign Service officers, by percentage, have uh, more fatalities than military officers. Yes, we're a much smaller group, uh, but uh, that's just a fact. Of, uh, we, we have the numbers to show it. So, uh, this has over time been a problem. It has been highlighted uh, as a result of what happened in Benghazi, but the fallout from Benghazi should not be, in, in our view, uh, that uh, the commanders on the ground, the ambassador, the emergency action committee, uh, should lose the right to decide uh, security issues uh, on the ground. So we're pushing back a bit on that. Let me add, a, if I could, a word on diversity, because I wanted to provide also yes. a slightly discordant voice. You, you mentioned that earlier. Um, I don't think we can declare victory at all on this issue. I don't want to leave people with that impression. There's a lot more work to be done on it. When I joined the Foreign Service in 89, the Foreign Service was reeling from a bunch of class action suits. It didn't happen that women zoomed up there mm -hmm. because the, everyone got enlightened. It was a class action by women in the Foreign Service and the settlement of that that led to hiring of more women. So it's legal action that opened it up by people, uh, not an administration changing its mind on its own. Uh, likewise for African Americans, it was a major class action uh, and a settlement that led to a change in policy. And so, um, and those changes are, are still being worked through and, and look at the numbers. The numbers are not uh, anywhere close to uh, what people should be proud of, um, frankly. Um, if you look at the senior foreign service, uh, women represent 30 percent way less than, uh, now maybe the rank and file is a higher number, we have those numbers. Hispanic Americans represent 4% of the senior foreign service. African Americans represent 5% of the senior foreign service. So there's a lot of room for growth in, in getting a more diverse uh, at, the, at, at our top levels. And, um, and so I just wanted to add that note in. And, and, and diversity in all its senses needs to be looked at and, uh, as well as the, pr the protected candidate. Uh, quality, uh, category. Ambassador Chacon, what can you and the Foreign Service Institute do to raise those numbers? I mean, a four and a five percent would seem to be inadequate. Bob makes an excellent point, and I didn't mean to suggest earlier that somehow we had arrived, we were satisfied with where we are. I don't think we're ever going to be, you know, satisfied in terms of where we are. Uh, when I talk about strategic recruitment, I think we, we want to do it differently that has a lasting impact. Yeah. Uh, so that, in, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the things that I think uh, we need to do a better job of is provide opportunities to people back, um, you know, in the early days of college and in high school. And I'm talking about paid internships. We inaugurated last year a U.S. Foreign Service uh, internship program where we bring um, largely economically disadvantaged uh, people. Again, uh, not a necessarily a particular underserved community, but, but broadly, uh, to Washington uh, for one summer. They're put up at a dorm at George Washington University. They work on a desk. They take some classes at FSI, uh, and they, they're paid a, a, a stipend. The following summer, they are given internships and embassies overseas. 
So therefore, you're leveling the playing field in that they understand the system is demystified to them. And again, you ignite a passion that mm -hmm. continues throughout their college career so that they can be very competitive mm -hmm. when they do uh, and if they do decide to take the exam. The Perkering and Rangel Fellowships, again, uh, f concentrated on, you know, on largely now on graduate students, but the same kind of, of program where you're basically taking the best of the best, nurturing this education so that, you know, they're, they're fully uh, functioning and competitive when they come into the Foreign Service. Um, I'd like to look at more public-private partnerships regarding financing of these internship programs. Uh, they're largely unpaid at this point and unless you come from a university that happens to give you a stipend or whatever and and it is a it, it really is a, a disadvantage to people who don't live in the Washington area or, the, or, or, or you know the eastern seaboard to to really assume such kind of a cost to see if in fact this is actually a business for them. So we, we, we can do more, um, and of course I'm going to go see Senator Menendez tomorrow to talk about what more we can expect from Congress, whether it's an authorization or an appropriation, to have these kinds of funds to be able to invest in these populations that I, I'm confident uh, will change in a generation the way the uh, Foreign Service looks today. Susan, you raised the critical issue of divided families. Mm -hmm. In the departure of well-trained, targeted, rec um, recruited officers, who's leaving first? Is there a racial divide? Is there an age divide mm. among those who can no longer sustain a divided family? and a single, mm. an unaccompanied tour? Yeah, no, it's a great question. It's something we follow really closely is looking at who's leaving the agency because uh, as with the State Department, with our Foreign Service, we went through a real surge over the last five years. 50% of our Foreign Service have less than five years in the agency. And we mm. actually look at that as a real opportunity because it changes the face of the, mm. of the agency and the Foreign Service in, in general. Uh, so we've been tracking the recidivism uh, very closely and we found that only about six to seven percent actually uh, leave the the Foreign Service and you know a couple years ago all of them their first tour was either Iraq Afghanistan uh, or Pakistan I mean they knew when they joined the Foreign Service they were going to be separated from their families so they came into the Foreign Service incredibly competitive process uh, for USAID as well as with State Department and they knew they were going to be separated so we were at, we've been actually encouraged uh, that that uh, we've had such a low rate now it's changed that it's not just those limited number of countries. You mentioned Benghazi, and that has that has changed uh, the way we work. We have 16 countries that at some point we call them non-permissive environment countries. They're countries that at some point you will be unaccompanied. They are really tough places to serve. Um, you, you may be able to bring a spouse, but not necessarily children. You need additional training. And so what we're working on is not just the security training, which has been sort of the typical and traditional approach to this, but actually what we call the staff care. How do we take care of our staff and their families before they leave for post, while they are there, and then most importantly, when they either return home or in their next post. Mm. And so we're, we are actually doing an assessment right now to look at those services and how do we improve them, how do we increase our support to our staff, and working closely with the State Department on that as well. I'm going to open it up to the audience now, but I have just one short story which follows on from what Susan said. When my husband left on an unaccompanied tour, this is 2005 and he goes to Iran, mm -hmm. mm. I got into the car and I set off with my seven-year-old, our seven-year-old son, to take <coughs> him up to summer camp at Plattsburgh. Mm. I was so unhappy that I was driving at 98 miles mm -hmm. an hour. The road's good and the road's empty, but the police didn't like it. <laughs> so I got stopped and I got pulled over. <clears throat> and all I could say to the officer is, I just lost my husband. Please understand. It made no impact whatsoever. <laughs> the fine still remained at $150. <laughs> but I do know what it's like mm -hmm. when one half of the family leaves for an unaccompanied tour. Now, open up to all of you. Please, would you identify yourself and make a question? Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for this refreshing, oh, 
I'm loud. Hello, good morning. I'm Rachel Gold Brown. Um, thank you for this refreshing panel. It was like really good to get an honest, you know, feedback for what's really going on. Um, my question is, you had mentioned like politicals are, you labeled a bit of a problem. And I was just wondering, um, Ms. Negroponte or whomever can answer, how exactly are politicals a problem for the Foreign Service track? I mean, I know it sounds kind of ignorant, but I really like to know, like, how do you see it as a problem sometimes? If Robert, okay. would you address sure. this? Sure. Um, yes, it is a problem in that uh, it depends on the balance between career and non-career people, but you want to make sure that uh, all these great people that we're recruiting and bringing into the Foreign Service have the ability to go up and uh, develop their careers and go up to the highest levels. You know, the most talented people. It's a very, up, it's an up or out system. It's a, the Foreign Service is, you know, meritocracy. And, and uh, we want those top people to, to rise up and have positions of responsibility. And, and to do that, there needs to be those positions at the top. And uh, when there are fewer and fewer of those coming, um, that's the problem. Um, right now, um, there are s uh, at the undersecretary level, there are six undersecretaries, only one career person. Uh, at the assistant secretary level of state altogether, um, there are 17 of them. There's only eight career people there out of the 17. At USAID, there are zero. Uh, at the assistant administrator that are career people, they're all political. But that has been the case for a long time at AID, I believe. So it's, it's a concern. Uh, now, uh, some of those should be talented people, and it's up to the president and the secretary and the administrator of AID to decide what that mix should be, but our role as the uh, representative of the career people is to make sure that there's room at the top for our top performers. So. A gentleman in the yellow shirt. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeremy Weiss. I'm a professor at George Washington University. Uh, I heard everyone on the panel discuss recruitment. Uh, as someone on the outside looking in, uh, I began applying for the Foreign Service after I finished my PhD three years ago. Unfortunately, I believe I missed Diplomacy 3.0. By the time I made it to the register, uh, it was a month before the sequester began. I expired off the register. In my uh, subsequent candidacy, I received a letter saying I would not be invited back to the interview due to budget cuts, uh, that they were not inviting very many people. Um, so it's, it, it's interesting to hear you speak about recruitment when I and many people I know have been banging down the doors. Uh, other you know, people who I know who are very qualified speak foreign languages, lived abroad, et cetera. And the funding picture seems so bleak. Um, I recently initiated another. Jeremy, I want, My I want is, Ambassador you, Chacon to answer this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Can you offer any hope for those of us who are still trying? <laughs> as, I, as I noted, we're hiring just to attrition, and this year that's 260 only. <laughs> you can imagine you know, the intense competition, uh, and this is a function of resources. We, we, we're looking at, at things like flexible hiring authorities, for instance, you know, because of the, de the demand for visa adjudicators on the consular side. We are, uh, have, have a parallel um, a program of limited non-career appointments uh, for up to five years for people to serve in, in that capacity. Uh, again, w we're looking at all of these other flexibilities to actually meet meet the immediate needs that we have before us. But it is very frustrating because, you know, it's a year-to-year -year uh, issue in terms of, you know, will we have the resources, will we not? Mm -hmm. But um, uh, let, let me tell you that some of the best Foreign Service officers that I know of took the exam, you know, two and three times. They, they, they stood with it. Uh, and, and, and again, it, it did pay off in the end because, you know, we are in a situation where we're going to have many, many more baby boomers retiring soon. So again, that will open up opportunities, but it's hard to predict. Lady with a black hat. Hi, yes, I'm uh, Dr. Valencia Campbell. I am interested in knowing what assessment have you made of your examinations? I mean, you've talked about uh, the litigation role in terms of bringing in more women, bringing in more minorities, and so forth. But I'd like to know over time, what did the examination look like when uh, some of the women that were are on the stage, um, you know, had to take it versus what does it look like now? And what are you doing about assessing um, the examination itself? Two members of our panel could answer this, but I'm going to ask Susan to start. 
Oh, okay, because we actually do have a different process for bringing people into the Foreign Service. So just to pick up, we're hiring 160 Foreign Services, foreign service Officers this year in USAID. And if you just want to learn a little bit more about our mission and our core values, Thank I'll you. leave that here for you. And so as a result, we actually don't have an exam. We do require that everybody who's applying to the Foreign Service has a master's degree because development really is a discipline and we look for different technical areas where people have a deep discipline. Uh, and it's a, actually, I think the application process isn't so hard. The interview is a day-long interview and uh, lots of competition for that. But uh, we really are focusing on diversity and recruitment because the numbers that Bob just cited are exactly what we have to really address. Ambassador. In 2007, I believe, Secretary Rice had that very same question about, uh, you know, what is it about this testing system that is working and isn't working? So uh, we had McKinsey and Company come in and kind of do an evaluation of, of, of the process. And, and, and they discovered, they said, you know, you're the only institution that we're aware of that really doesn't place more stock in experience, expertise, and education. Mm -hmm. You're so keen to be blind as you go out and get this, and this is perhaps when it was pale male and Yale before, and so they went, the pendulum swung too much to the other side, that, that again, in the, in the process, they were really not evaluating uh, 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 contributions that others may make if they don't just go through the written and the oral exam. So, so that was uh, um, important in instituting what we call the Qualifications Evaluation Panel, where uh, people are urged to, um, you know, give a little bit more about their background and their experience and apply that to, you know, uh, to, to, to the exam so that one could perhaps judge potential in that regard. We've done things like um, try to demystify the written exam. So for instance, we have um, uh, an online exam that gives almost immediate feedback to people in terms of you know where they're doing well, where they're not doing well, what they can do to increase their chances there. We have uh, uh, an expansive uh, system of information sessions before people take the oral exam that we invite everyone that is going to be taking that oral exam to come. They talk to a diplomat in residence. They, they talk about the exam that they're going to be having the next day. Um, it, 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 it's not really giving them a leg up, but it's really demystifying, you know, what's going on there, especially for people outside the East Coast. I think this is all new for them. So we are continually evaluating it. On Friday, I'll go to the Board of Examiners for our yearly meeting to again look at this. We have a, an industrial psychologist on staff that, that works with us to ensure that we're not, um, you know, uh, that we, we've got our unconscious biases under control because there are so many factors that you know influence you know when people are taking these exams that we just want to make sure that we're we're getting better and better all of the time um, and um, our system has been commended uh, the issue again is that it's an incredibly competitive process and we don't always have as many openings as we should because frankly there's so many good people out there that that we could usefully use in the foreign service Perhaps Congress will see an investment in diplomacy is really much wiser than having to invest in, 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 in you know, DOD down the line when we have a problem that wasn't solved by diplomacy. May I repeat that again? Investment <laughs> in diplomacy. The gentleman without a hat on this side. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, the answer of both the Director your, General Your and name, please. Well, my name is, is Bill Harrop. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. Ambassador, welcome. Uh, the, uh, the answer that uh, both the Director General and Bob Silverman gave to Mrs. Negroponte's question about the implications of the growing political appointee presence, not only at the ambassadorial level, but at, well down into the system, as I heard the answer, it was essentially, well, we get on very well with these people. There, a lot of them are really fine folk, and it just is a pretty good arrangement altogether working. Uh, later on, uh, uh, Bob Silverman talked about the implications for the career ladder Do you of have the a question, service. Ambassador Harris? I have a question for the, the career ladder of the Foreign Service. Uh, however, it seems to, I'd like to ask if you don't think that there's a certain interest on the part of the United States of America in having trained people in these positions, having people with overseas diplomatic experience uh, answering back to the government and to the people with their, with their expertise and their knowledge isn't it an advantage to have experienced Foreign Service people 
whether it's an advantage to them or not, it's an advantage to the country, I think. What, what do you say to that? Bob, Bob, why don't you start on this one? Well, thank you, Bill. <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, well, I mean, I think we have to be realistic. This is a part of our system that the U.S. has, and that uh, we have uh, traditionally and up till today, you know, a high percentage of people from outside the system coming in and being brought in by administrations of both parties. Um, it's higher than our uh, counterpart foreign ministries. There's no other foreign ministry, in, in any, as I mentioned, in any developed country that has as high a percentage of ambassadors, uh, senior officials in, inside the ministry, inside the State Department in our is case. It's a good thing? Uh, it's, yeah, it is. You know, it, it is what it is. It's, it's an existing part of our system. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, there are pluses and minuses like anything else. The pluses are you know, you don't have a stale group of people. You have people coming in from Microsoft, from outside, who bring in outside perspectives. That's positive. Uh, um, the negative side is that it can freeze uh, the lady's question. I mean, that there's a direct correlation between fewer jobs at the top and the number of people coming in at the bottom because it's a trickle-down effect. Uh, if there are fewer positions uh, f at the senior levels, uh, that means also fewer hiring opportunities at the entry levels as well. So it, 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 it does have a direct impact on career development of the professional staff. Um, is it good for the country? I, I think it, it has to be looked at. So thus I can say, uh, if, if the outside people coming in are qualified, if they bring in strong qualifications, um, I think you can make a case for, for the continuation of that practice. But I think it has to be looked at, yes. Master Harrop, I want to remind of the story of Jim Baker, Secretary of State, who was deciding who he would send to Moscow. Ambassador Jack Matlock, a Foreign Service officer, had been there for a number of years. But Baker thought that maybe the president of Coca-Cola might be a more suitable representative. Well, Matlock sat down one February to write three cables, which were handwritten so that no Soviet spy could take it up. When those three cables reached Washington, they were read both by the President, George H.W., and by Secretary Baker. They were so impressed with the quality of Ambassador Matlock's work and his insights into the Soviet system that the Coca-Cola <laughs> President was told, wait a bit longer or forget about it, and Matlock stayed. So I think that you, your very question confirms that the knowledge that Foreign Service officers bring to, their to the country they're assigned to, their cultural awareness and language, is indispensable. Please. Could you ask uh, the general and the ambassador to endorse for your position? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. We'll do it. But another question, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. I'd like to just make a, a brief comment because I'm, a and your uh, I'm name an ambassador of Barbados and I'm a political appointee. So I felt slightly under attack here. <laughs> 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 but, but the US ambassador to Barbados has the floor. No, it's the other way around. <laughs> it's a Barbados. Barbados. I'm, I'm Barbados to the US. Very good. But um, that, that's another story, but I'll deal with you afterwards. In a <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I was in the State Department here once, and after 10 minutes, the lady said to me, no, Ambassador, tell me something. You are the U.S. Ambassador to Barbados, right? <laughs> I said, no, it's the other way around. <laughs> but My mistake. But um, I will say this here. I think it's a question of balance, surely. Uh, you can't have all political appointees or no political appointees, and it's a question, too, of selecting in, a, in an appropriate manner. Uh, you can make very good political uh, appointees and you can make very bad political appointees. But I will say this to you, that um, I can tell you that in speaking to all ambassadors virtually around the world, the political ones have a harder time because once they go into position, there's almost the enemy. You're treated as the enemy within your own department because you're seen as taking somebody's job or something else. The other thing is I will say is this, um, th there's a tendency for uh, people in government, and, and uh, I must say that uh, I'm not one that thinks almost any government is efficient, it's just their nature, and decisions are never made vertically. But what I notice is that if I have an issue, and I say to the, to the people with me, I said, um, well, let's discuss it, and then I come up with an idea, and they say, Ambassador, but you can't do it that way, you, you, you come from a different world. 
I said, but, but let's deal with the issue and deal with the solution. I don't care if it's from the man in the moon or, or private sector or whatever. So those are just some of my brief comments on that there. <laughs> thank you. The Ambassador Barbados, thank you for your, for your comment. This is a last question because then Kathy Johnson has got some remarks. A gentleman sitting just behind Kathy. Thanks. Yes. Uh, my name is Alex Tierski, and uh, I work for the Congressional Research Service. I was debating whether or not to raise that given the calls for resources, but uh, <laughs> luckily I don't make decisions. I just advise. Um, I do have two questions. Uh, the words expeditionary diplomacy have come up several times. Mm -hmm. I'd like perhaps if the panelists could talk a little bit about, uh, in particular, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, and Pakistan, whether we are still providing the right levels of incentives for people to go there, mm -hmm. and what kind of impact those posts will continue to have on, on your respective foreign services. The, um, the second question I have is the State Department's budget justification this year has uh, a significant focus on locally employed staff wage gaps. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hear that 65% of the State Department workforce uh, mentioned Right. in the panel. I thought perhaps you would want to uh, say something. Thank Ambassador Shekhom, would you address the first question, please? Sure. Um, very good question about incentives because um, I think every director general's nightmare is having to direct assignments to send people where they don't want to go. Although we all join understanding uh, that we've agreed to worldwide availability and we could be sent anywhere, um, we, we have such a diverse uh, interested group that, that you know, want to go to all of these kinds of assignments and, and, and really don't shy away from hardship. Uh, uh, incentives are very, very important. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the first one that is most attractive is, has to do with linkage of assignments. So you know, if you make a commitment to a hardship post, whether that's Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Libya, uh, you you uh, can tie that assignment to your future assignment in another area, for instance, that, that, that you'd like to serve. And it's not all, everybody just wants to go to Rome. I mean, I was just in Mexico and people along the border, you know, were coming from Afghanistan and Iraq. So, so, so that, that's, that's, that's good as well. And certainly it comes down to resources as well. Uh, again, you know, providing those financial incentives for people you know, who go at great risk and have to leave families behind and incur other uh, expenses. Uh, yes, that, that, that is a big part of it, but it's not the overriding factor and it's not that we have to tempt people with those incentives to get them to go do the work that they naturally want to do in the first place. Susan, the gap with locally hired foreign service nationals. Yes, thank you so much for raising that because uh, within the State Department, I think it's 50%. For USAID, our foreign service nationals are 60%. They are the backbone of, I don't think just our USAID missions, but our embassies. They are the institutional knowledge. They are the people who have contacts within ministries, with the private sector, with civil society, because it's their cousins, their sisters, their brothers. There's just, they are our family when we live overseas. So um, they are absolutely essential. And uh, what we have done within USAID over the last uh, five years is to elevate their issues. We've created a, far, a worldwide foreign service Service National Council where they elect members and we have dialogue on issues of everything from compensation issues which we are obviously all not pleased with the current status and working hard to change uh, to uh, just how to create mentoring programs for them career development paths for them and uh, as, as partners. So what we found over the last year and a half since we've launched uh, the council, and uh, it's been tremendously uh, successful because we've been able to really make progress. That said, I think all of us, the State Department and USAID, feel very strongly that we need to be doing much more on the compensation issue. And as the global economy has changed so much, they have a lot of alternatives. And uh, they want to stay and work for us because they love our mission. Uh, they love the mission of the State Department, they love the mission of USAID, but it's very tempting when you have Coca-Cola and some of the other uh, clearly competitors out there who are tempting them away. So mm. lots of work to be done. Alex, will you follow up afterwards? You need numbers. You need stats for your report. <laughs> so <laughs> afterwards... <coughs> Can I mention something about expeditionary diplomacy? Yes, I just wanted of course. to say, because that's such a good question. Um, you know, I'm concerned about it because uh, it's true that our... Um, State Department Foreign Service is uh, reducing numbers in places like Afghanistan and, and Iraq for good reason. Uh, but that kind of mission, the ex what we're calling expeditionary diplomacy, which is you going in uh, to 
non-traditional environments where there may not be a strong a central state and, and working at the local level, building up local capacity, working with AID in particular, with its Office of Transition Initiatives, working with our military colleagues, civilian affairs officers, that kind of mission is not going away. It's, it's you know, maybe it's Ni northern Nigeria, maybe it's in future in Syria, uh, and there'll be other places where that type of mission, what we're calling expeditionary diplomacy, will be needed. And we need people trained and prepared and experienced in doing that. So thank you for that question. I would now like to invite Kathy Johnson, the director of the U.S. Diplomacy Center, to come up and say a few words. Thank you, Thank you. First, allow me to thank the Wilson Center for co-hosting this event with the United States Diplomacy Center today, and special thanks to our wonderful moderator who did yes. a fantastic job of keeping this lively and interesting discussion going. Yeah. As I listened, it was really interesting for me. I am a career member of the Senior Foreign Service and the daughter of a career member of the Senior wow. Foreign Service. So I have seen many changes over my life with the uh, State Department. And so uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for a great job of capturing what the major issues mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. highlighting them, and providing thought-provoking issues for discussion. And a particular thanks to our new Director General, Ambassador Chacon, welcome to you. We look forward to many future conversations. Um, the uh, Diplomacy Center, if I can digress for just a second, will be a venue that will allow us to continue these discussions. It will be a place where students, where visitors can come to learn about American diplomacy, to learn about who diplomats are, what they do, what are the issues they work on, and why do we do what we do. The Diplomacy Center is a public-private, the product of a public-private partnership, and I'd like to give a special shout out today to our private sector partner, the Diplomacy uh, Center Foundation. Uh, the president of the Diplomacy Center Foundation is here today, Ambassador Bill Harrop. Bill, thank you for coming, and thank you very much for your constant support and your dedication to the Diplomacy Center. Uh, you heard earlier about our exhibit, Faces of Diplomacy, that is here in the Reagan Building. Uh, this exhibit, as was mentioned, highlights the work of some of our diplomats, some of our foreign service officers, some of the people who support diplomacy, who work in diplomacy. So I would invite you to go down to the lobby in the Reagan Building, listen to their stories, watch the videos, look at the photos, find out who are the faces of, of our foreign service. It's in the atrium, and it'll be on display here until March 11th. Finally, I'd like to thank the audience for coming today. Thank you for engaging in this conversation with us. And we look forward to seeing you at the Diplomacy Center in a few years when we, we open. And in the meanwhile, you're welcome to follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, and we even have a live construction cam yeah. so that you can see <laughs> what the cranes are doing by the hour oh and what progress yes. we're making to get the <laughs> Diplomacy Center actually built. So yeah, thanks again to the United Wilson States. Center and to our distinguished panelists and moderator for a great event today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Good.